All right, I think I'll get started. Um, so you guys remember this problem? The super ball and clay, right? And so the question is, you're trying to close this door and you want to you wanna throw either the super ball or the clay and have the most chance of having the door completely closed, right? And so the, the super ball is the one that generates the most impulse because the change in velocity, the super ball um, goes towards the door with an initial velocity and it completely rebounds and it, it ends up with a velocity in the opposite direction. So the fact that um, the change in velocity here is actually two times the incoming velocity. And in the case of the clay, it's only, it just stops. So it's only a change, uh, change of velocity times one. And so the, the, the momentum, Yeah, so, so change in momentum is equal to mass times the change in velocity. So the fact that the super ball has a change of velocity of 2v means that you're going to get twice as much change in momentum. And that, that change in momentum is imparted on the door. So the more change in momentum to the door means it's going to um, have a greater chance of closing. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so in the again, this is this is just another example of the definition of system, and the system in this case includes all of th these three objects. Yeah, and so. The total momentum of a system subjected to only internal forces is conserved. In other words, if there's no forces that go across the system boundary, then momentum is conserved among all these guys. But if there's an external force, then, then that, those external forces can create what? Those external forces can create a impulse J, which is force times delta T, which creates a change in momentum, right? So the this is a really important, it's called the impulse momentum theorem. Uh, but if it is if it is if it is an isolated system and often you want to make your system such that it is isolated, then the final momentum is equal to the initial momentum, right? And that's true for multiple particles. If you have multiple particles, the final, the sum of all the momentums of the final particles is equal to the sum of the momentum of the initial particles, right? And then because momentum is a vector, it's got X and Y components, you have to look at the X component momentum separate from the Y component momentum, right? Like kinematics, dynamics, we always had to separate the X and the Y. We have to do that here if, if the collision is two dimensional. All right, the, so momentum, how do you know that it's a momentum problem? You, you wanna use it for cases when there are collisions or explosions. Right, if something's coming together or if something's blowing apart or coming apart, uh, you can use momentum and it's conserved. The way you approach these problems um, always is to have a before and after picture. What does it look like before the collision? What does it look like just after the picture, after the collision? And that'll help show you how to write these momentum initial and final, right? Which is you know, MV, sum of all the mass velocity equals sum of mass velocity final. Right, and again, if it's two dimensional, write separate equations for the X and Y directions. 
Um, so let's look at let's look at an example. Right, we've got two two um, ice skaters. They're facing each other. They're pushing off. This would be an example of an explosion, right? Even though there's no explosives, they are pushing against each other and they're ending up going separate. Um, so the again, we're going to start and we're going to say when if, if this was a FRQ, we would say momentum is conserved. We'd probably get one point for that, right? Then we'd say P final equals P initial. And what's the what's the final? Well, the final is um, this guy's going in this direction, the girl's going in this direction, and so mass times velocity uh, David final plus mass of Sandra times the velocity of Sandra final equals the initial. Well, the initial is they're neither of them are moving. So mass of David plus mass of Sandra times the velocity of David and Sandra. They're both they're both zero. All right. And so now we can, we continue to fill in what we know. Uh, we know that Sandra is going 2.2 meters per second. Because this is a vector, we need to figure out which direction we're going to make positive. I'm going to say to the right is positive. So Sandra's final velocity is 2.2 positive. Her mass is 45 kilograms. Uh, the mass of David is 80 kilograms. And his final velocity, we don't know. All right, so now we see we have an equation that has one unknown we can solve for that. And so we're going to get velocity of David final is going to be equal to 45 times 2.2. It's going to be negative because we subtracted it from both sides. And we're going to divide by 80. We're going to get 1.24 minus 1.24 meters per second, right? So now we know that David um, David's going to be moving to the left. It's negative. It's going to be 1.24 1 meters per second. And so if you think about it just conceptually, right, David weighs more and Sandra weighs less so it makes sense that she would end up going faster because she's less mass than he would be and so indeed his velocity is less than the 2.2 that she had um, okay so the question here is what's the total change in momentum and anytime anytime you have a force times force times time graph force by time is going to be impulse, right? Not to be confused with force times displacement. What would be the force times displacement graph? What would that indicate? Uh, the amount of work. Exactly. So that's work, which is also equal to change in energy. Change in energy. And the impulse is going to be equal to the change in momentum, right? So, yeah, anytime you see force, you, you want to make sure you know whether it's displacement or time, and that'll help you tell you whether it's work and energy or if it's impulse, right? In this case, it's impulse. The area here, the area here is equal to impulse equal to j which is equal to the change in momentum all right 
Uh, there's two kinds of two kinds of collisions. There's elastic and inelastic, right? And in the case of an inelastic collision, they stick together and they move together with a common final velocity. So examples of that are clay hitting the floor, a bullet embedding itself in wood. And what's really important is that energy is not conserved. Right, and so the way you remember that is, you know, if a bullet's embedding itself in wood, there was some work done, right? This work actually pushes itself uh, into the wood. There's a force times displacement as a result of that, which we know is work, which we know is a change in energy, right? So if there's there's work done, there's a change in energy, then energy is not conserved. Or in the case of the clay, the clay hits the floor, there's some work done in, in um, compressing this or, or deforming the clay. All right, so this is, uh, I think this is really useful. We have two types of collision, elastic. There are two final, velocities, they, um, they don't stick together and energy is conserved. So when we solve this problem, we're gonna have momentum final, it's gonna be equal to momentum initial because, and the, so the momentum final is gonna be momentum of one final plus momentum of two final. And that's going to be M V one final plus M V two final. So we're going to have two, we're going to have two variables here, V one final, V two final, but only one equation. So what you want to do is you want to also um, kinetic energy final is going to be equal to kinetic energy initial. And in this case, you're going to have one half M V1 final squared plus one half M V2 final squared. Right, and so now we have another equation that has those two final variables and that's how you would solve an elastic is to write both of these equations, right? In the case that they stick together, right? Momentum final is gonna be momentum initial. And in the case of momentum final, you're gonna have mass of one plus mass of two times a, a common final velocity. So they're not velocity of one and two, it's a single velocity because they're stuck together. And therefore you only need one equation to find that unknown. All right, does that make sense? Yes, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, did you post the slides? I've not yeah. posted the slides. I'll, um, I'll post the recording of this once I'm done. These, okay. by the way, these slides, uh, these slides came from the lectures that we had this year. Oh, okay. So okay. there's nothing new here. I've just picked out the ones that are, are relevant, but I'll post, um, I'll post the video, right? Okay. All right, so again, as um, if these things occur in two dimensions, you, you um, need to do separate equations for X and Y, right? Momentum X, momentum Y, those are completely separate equations. All right, and so this is a really good matrix to have for this. We know the momentum initial is equal to momentum final. Uh, we've got object one, object two, and then a final object one, object two, and then we have X and Y. So this table's um, really helpful in solving these problems. So let us read this problem. We've got two pucks of equal mass that collide on a table. Um, prior to the 
collision, puck one travels in a direction that's x axis at one meters per second. So one is going to be going one meter per second in the x direction. Puck two is in the minus y direction. It's going to be going down two meters per second. So this is the before picture. Um, after, after the collision, puck two travels 30 degrees above the x direction. So after puck two travels. Thirty degrees above the x direction uh, at point zero point eight meters per second. Puck two. What is the velocity, direction, and speed of puck one after the collision? So the question is one. Where is it going? It right, seems like a pretty difficult problem, but filling out this table will help us. Um, yeah, let's start with that. All right, so this is the this is the before, right? The initial puck one has an x velocity, and so the momentum of puck one is going to be mass times its velocity in the x direction, which is one times. 0 0.1, 0 0.1 kilogram times one meter per second. Puck one, sorry, puck one in the y direction has zero, it has zero velocity. It's not going vertically at all. Puck two, let's look at, let's look at puck two. Puck two is going in the negative y direction. So minus two times 0.1, and it has no horizontal component, so the horizontal is zero. All right, and then if we look at final um, puck one, we don't know. So puck one, we're gonna have a velocity um, x final. Velocity one x final. And we're going to have velocity one y final. Um, puck two in the x direction is going to be 0.8, and we want the, the x component, so it's going to be times cosine of 30. And puck two in the y direction is going to be 0 0.8 sine 30. All right, so now we've got this equal sign. We're going to have two separate equations, one for x. So here we're going to say 1 times 0 0.1 or 0 0.1 equals v1 final x plus 0.8 cosine 30. And then this equation we're going to have, this is 2 meters per second, right? Minus 2. So we're going to get minus 0.2 equals v1 final y plus 0.8 sine of 30. Right, and if we solve for V1 final X, I get minus 0.59 I think that's right. Did I do that right? Oh, 
this is the velocity. We also need the point one here, don't we? And in fact, point one's everywhere. So we can divide everything by, and this wouldn't be velocity one, this would be m times velocity one. So I'm gonna, since the pucks are all 100, 100 grams, I'm gonna eliminate the velocities of the masses and just, they, they divide out. So in this case, it's one meter per second. In this case, it's minus two meters per second. You guys follow that? Right, every one of these should be, to be momentum, should be mass times velocity. But because the masses are all the same, I can divide by mass and the velocities. That won't work if the masses are different, right? But it does work as it turns out when they're the same. All right, so one minus 0.8. And so I get V1 final X equals 0.3 meters per second and I get uh, V1 final Y equals minus 2.4 meters per second, All right? So it's asking for direction and speed, not the X and Y components. So we're gonna use the Pythagorean theorem here to find the direction and the speed. Square root of 2.4 squared plus 0.3 squared. We get 2.42 meters per second. And then the angle is going to be tangent inverse of minus 2.4 divided by 0.3. And I get um, minus 82 degrees, right? So what it says is that this is going to go off in basically this direction. Right, and so then, then I want to look at kind of thinking about, does this make sense? And to me, it makes sense because we had a lot of, we had a lot of um, momentum going down. And so in order for this momentum still going up a little bit, this one had to go down quite a bit. So it makes sense the angle's large. It makes sense that the, um, the velocity is high. All right. So let's see, I got one other thing to consider. which is what kinds of what kinds of problems do we have right we can have collision collision elastic we can have collision inelastic and we can have explosion And the explosions are usually, um, we don't consider them inelastic or elastic, right? So now what does the picture look like? I'm gonna say this is before, and this is after. And so we're gonna draw pictures of what those look like. And the collision before, elastic. We're gonna have two objects and they're gonna be going towards each other, right? What happens afterwards? 
they're still separate. Right, so one and two afterwards, one and two. They may or may not both be going um, in opposite directions. It could be that um, it could be that this velocity is really, really high and this guy is really massive. And it could it could end up being that they both end up going this way, right? Right. So one example of that is the the trek and the mosquito, right? If the trek runs in the mosquito, um, <laughs> they're both going to be going to the you know, if this is the trek, then they're both going to be going this way. The mosquito is not going to cause the trek to change its direction. All right, because this is elastic, you need both momentum and kinetic energy equals kinetic energy final. You're going to need both those equations. All right, the inelastic picture before. Similar. We've got these guys that are colliding, uh, but then we have one plus two, and it's going to go in some direction we don't know in some magnitude. And in this case, we can just say momentum initial equals momentum final. All right. Uh, what does the explosion look like before and after? Before. Yeah, so the explosion we're going to have one plus two together. And it may have a velocity, it may not. Could be could be zero, right? And then after we're going to have one and two going off in their opposite directions, right? And so in this case, momentum initial is going to be equal to momentum final. Oftentimes, this explosion, they're not moving. So it's zero equals momentum one final plus momentum two final. Right. In this case, it's going to be momentum one initial plus momentum two initial equals momentum one plus two final. All right. So those are the those are typically the three kinds of problems that you uh, might see in momentum. Um, I'll add one more thing, and that is it's very common. Very common to see a problem where you've got objects that are um, sliding down, and then they they collide, right? And so. This, this period, because there's a height change, we would use energy, right? But this at the point in time when this collision occurs, we're gonna use momentum, right? So very common for problems to, to, for them to combine energy and momentum in the same problem. And you just need to know that when things are changing height, that we're using energy and when there are collisions that are occurring, it's gonna be momentum. All right, so with that, that's what I had for the lecture or the review. Gonna... All right, so we're gonna do an explosion here. We have a before where we've got this rock that has V equals zero. And after we're going to have one 
these two pieces and one's going to go off with v1 final and this is going to have v2 final and let's just for a moment say this is one kilogram and these are each a half a kilogram Right, so we're going to have one kilogram times zero equals the final is going to be V1 final times 0.5 kilograms plus V2 final times 0.5 kilograms. All right, and so yeah, we, we most likely would be getting be given one of these velocities, right? So let's say that V1 final is minus two meters per second. Um, this kind of symmetrical problem, can you guess what the velocity is of V2? Just two meters. Yeah. Let's, let's work it out. We have zero equals minus two times 0.5 plus V2 final times 0.5. Right, and so really simple way to do this is to say that these divide by 0.5, move the point minus two to the other side, and so we get two equals V2 final. Yeah, good. All right, was that helpful, Michael?